Okay. Uh, firstly, I want to express my gratitude to the Far Eastern uh, FEFU Vladivostok and uh, IWAS. I'm not going by my physical age, but I'm here as a fellow learner, but I'll share my viewpoints. So thank you for the opportunity to be here. This is an era of unprecedented global transformation. And the Indo-Pacific stands at the forefront of a new world order marked by an intricate web of security challenges, cooperation. And the more we dive into this landscape, it is very clear that uh, it be the waters we navigate are turbulent and yet teeming with possibility. So a journey through the Indo-Pacific promises to offer a glimpse into the future of global politics as we confront the tides of change that subtly yet irrevocably reshape the world around us. The international order appears stable on the surface, but if you closely examine, there are three shifts I would talk. Uh, one is the maritime security and regional cooperation. Second is the impact of climate change. And uh, the thirdly is this entire emerging concept of biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. So in this talk, I want to go through uh, these three aspects. I will be talking about the maritime domain. I will address a few theoretical paradigms uh, from my own uh, uh, PhD work. And I will close with some thoughts on regional cooperation as the direction. But before I start that, I'm going to take about 15 seconds and pay this tribute. These are three visuals. Two are from the Bay of Biscay, where an Indian, Commander Abhilash Tommy, is about 100 miles from Las de Olon and about to finish a solo circumnavigation, which has been won by the person on the right, a South African lady sailor. The original uh, race more than 54 years ago was won by a Britisher. Is there a shift happening? Maybe. And on the bottom left is Indian naval ship Take, 11 years after its commission in Russia, today is providing evacuation operations. There are many things happening in the world. But let's, let's go on to what I want to talk about. As global powers emerged during the transition from the medieval to modern era, the Mar Liberum enunciation of Yoga Grotus and its associated Mar Clausum did show the rise of maritime prowess right through the Industrial Revolution and the two world wars. Classical realism and international liberalism interplayed on the global stage, marked by the collapse of the League of Nations and the subsequent birth of United Nations after World War II. In the subsequent eight decades, Power dynamics have unfolded through bipolar, unipolar, multilateral, minilateral. We will lose sight. I think I agree with uh, my previous speaker. Polarity as a concept is probably being challenged. But in the midst of these shifting sands, the maritime domain remains a steadfast pillar of freedom and good order. Despite fluctuations in global order, the seas continue as the lifeblood of the world's economy and sustenance. As geopolitics merges and transitions into geoeconomics in the later part of the previous century, seafaring, maritime connectivity, commerce and ocean jurisdiction and jurisprudence provides an anchor of stability. Even as the ocean's significance for global trade and commerce grows, securing the seas becomes a top priority. And today there is a competition for resources. Non-state actors like pirates, traffickers and terrorists exploit the vastness of the oceans. And as we evolve into these security challenges, it is essential to see the environment remain stable. Climate change and sustainability are the most pressing issues facing the world. The great Pacific garbage patch is not just a topic for National Geographic, but dead zones created by excessive nutrient eutrophication lead to hypoxic or low oxygen areas are no longer a local phenomena. They endanger maritime life. And ocean acidification and disrupted cycles threaten the Earth's delicate balance, where this becomes the key order of attention, even if it is not popular to choose so. And in this aspect, I want to talk, even as we transition from seeing the sea 
as global commons, now redefined as the global environmental commons with the BBNJ or biodiversity beyond national jurisdictions. We are seeing a transition where deep sea ecosystems uh, are crucial to ocean health. And as we explore and exploit this region with mindfulness of risk of irreparable harm, we need to balance economic development and conservation as essential. So this is the journey. We recognize sea as a global commons, but we want to slowly have jurisdiction over what was called the area when UNCLOS was being formed. And though jurisdiction becomes a valuable starting point, strategic convergences and divergence may lead to militarized deployments and weaponization. It is true, and I have as a former naval person say, the role of naval forces in maintaining maritime security has grown intricate. But beyond operations such as freedom of navigation and countering piracy, they have to face cyber threats and unmanned systems, and they will uh, need to address more of rescue operations and addressing the challenges of a climate. And so in that transition, I just want to talk briefly about theoretical constraints. Now I've presented on this visual the classical Western journey, which has seen uh, classic realism emerging to liberalism, uh, a belief in institutionalism, post-colonialism, feminism, and even constructivism. The problem that happens is each of these theories were fine in the context when they were defined. And it is suitable for a scholar to pick one over the other. But I feel they fall short in defining the primary attention when we come to the maritime domain. Very briefly, I am presenting that we need to do a maritime approach. And this is what has worked in my thesis, which operates at three levels. And this is what we see happening in the globe. There is a mandate. For example, when piracy was there, countries came across regardless of the polarity. And what was the common? There was a larger common interest. There were key stakeholders and the globe received a strategic direction. But in panning out that mandate, we needed mechanisms that ultimately progressed that larger mandate. It connected every single agency and component, state and non-state. And in classical operational terms, this is an operation level process. And that's at the level two, but in specific targets and mission, we need prescribed boundaries. When you go to a specific crisis and there are multiple crises, I'm not going down without the time with clear command and control and tactical integrity. This is the transition and look, I call it my maritime approach, not sufficiently developed to call a theory, but uh, I, I find it applies in many ways into many other international approaches. Thirdly, and I want, this is my last point, uh, the emerging world order is witnessing a shift into the Indo-Pacific, which uh, Dr. Josh spoke about and indirectly we talked. But this is an alphabet soup on the screen. ASEAN, very dominant uh, conversation and strategic direction. The Quad, which is anchored around the Indo-Pacific. The Asia-Africa Growth Corridor the Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative, the Indian Ocean Naval Symposium, the IORA, each of these is talking about a growth towards regional collaboration. So Indo-Pacific region is experiencing a significant power shift, maybe triggered by China's rise or the US-China cooperation. But what we are not realizing, India is an example, like Brazil, like South Africa, of nations which are rising uh, not because of one nation's polarity, because of the need to ensure collaboration. In conclusion, the evolving international order has witnessed significant changes, particularly in the maritime domain and the Indo-Pacific. As the world grapples with the impact of climate change and sustainability and biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction as a common environmental common, new theoretical constructs in international relations need to be examined further, where this is one of my central collaborative maritime competence. This is what India leads. When the prime minister says, Sagar, security and growth for all in the region, one nation cannot provide it. We have a collaborative construct. 
So as the international order evolves, it is crucial for countries to collaborate and strengthen regional institutions for an inclusive and rule-based order that respects the sovereignty of all. By embracing this cooperation and fostering a deep understanding of complex dynamics, the global community can navigate fragmentation of the international order and work towards a stable, secure, and collaborative future in the maritime domain. So the order changes, but like the currents of the oceans, it is a constant circulation. We would be tragic if we fixed some constructs of certain place forever. It will continuously evolve. Thank you, and I've completed. Uh, thank you very much, Commodore Johnson, uh, for the brilliant uh, presentations. So uh, I would request the audience, if there is any uh, questions from the audience, for Dr. Johnson. Okay. Yeah, I think Dr. Andre has raised it. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Johnson, for your uh, presentation. Uh, I wonder, in, in that part of your presentation, when you had the slide uh, of different theoretical approach, like realism, and, like finishing with feminism, and so on, uh, we can say that they were defined by, by the age when they emerged. Yeah, But we also could say that in most of the cases, uh, we can geographically define also where they have emerged actually, uh, in Europe or in North America. And in this regard, what is your opinion when we talk about Indian Ocean, when we talk about Indo-Pacific, do we probably need to find other topics? Yeah, uh, uh, Because I'm also like interested in the, in the issue of non-Western IR, and in this regard, can we find solutions there? Thank you for your question, Dr. Andre. I understand what you say. And this is one of the, I'm, I'm a student, I'm still learning IR, you know, after about uh, 10 plus years since my uh, work on it. You are right. Many theoretical constructs in international relations have a context of geography. If I would rather say the location, and the scholarship and the time period. And in that sense, we do sometimes extrapolate the principles to sometimes constructs where it was not originally meant to. In that sense, since we agree there is a center of gravity shift towards the Indo-Pacific, uh, one of the common things, you know, we don't realize India and Russia collaboration or India and other countries, we think continental, but the reality is maritime. I mean, I'm not just saying because I'm come from a maritime origin. If you a nation is secure on the maritime frontiers or on the maritime corridors, then this comes. What is why did I use the word maritime? I'm using it beyond the domain. I'm using it. A maritime domain is inherently collaborative. You know, when it was being said non-aligned, what we are saying is. We don't want polarity to define our identity. What we are saying is based on, that's what our foreign minister has been saying, Dr. Jay Shankar. When required, we will work with the concerned stakeholder. We are not forming into groups. So it goes against the classic principles. And that, for me, from the maritime domain, it is collaboration. Even if you are two contenders in a race, if one is in trouble, the maritime code ensures you will go to rescue. And we see that happen. So I'm picking principles. I'm calling it maritime, not only from domain, but the principles from the maritime domain, which is regional, where required global, collaborative, mutually building. And I think that's what we are finding happening in the Indo-Pacific.